Thank you very much. It's very nice to be in Cambridge with you all. I've actually just fairly recently moved to UCL and in the maths department there, which is not in this nice fancy building, which is the one you see in all the pictures, it's in this kind of ramshackle house. <laughs> 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 Here's another picture from London. Uh, this is Tower Bridge, uh, lit up for the King's coronation. Strangely, seemingly in the French colours, but anyway. <laughs> and I live uh, somewhere on the north side of the river, and occasionally I go to the south side. I like the south side, uh, but I don't know it so well, so it's always a little bit of an adventure. I feel slightly out of my depth, and I'm, I'm quite glad when there are people there who live in that area who can show me around. And in the same kind of theme, this program and um, the first workshop is built as a bridge between different communities. And I'm very much in this, this community of non-equilibrium statistical physics. Occasionally, I make a little venture over to the other side, but I feel um, I don't know things so well. Um, I like it. I'm learning a lot. Um, but it's a new territory for me. And I'm enjoying learning things um, in this program. And hopefully, there's, there's more to learn. So I'm not going to try and contribute today to this, this big bridge. I'm going to tell you about a somewhat less significant bridge. And I'm going to get thrown out of Cambridge soon. <laughs> what I want to do in this talk is to, to try and build a, a mathematical bridge between non-equilibrium statistical physics and equilibrium statistical physics. So a much smaller endeavor. And if you think, well, you're being a bit shortchanged. What's that got to do with biology? Well, I'm going to do that in the context of some, some toy models that appear in biophysics. So on the, the new side of the bridge, in the non-equilibrium side, I'll be talking about run and tumble models that we've already heard a bit about in various talks. And I'm going to try and convince you that they have a connection to a model from the old equilibrium side that has to do with DNA. Um, so hopefully that will be interesting. Um, if you go to sleep now, at least you've got the, the main idea. <laughs> so if you want to stay awake, uh, this is where we're going. Um, I'll start with um, an introduction, giving a fairly gentle overview of some ideas from non-equilibrium, so current fluctuations and large deviations. Reset, we've heard a lot about that already, of course, and what reset has to do with run and tumble. And then there'll be Two main parts to the talk. And then we're in Cambridge, there's no part three, just part one and part two. And mainly we'll spend our time on part one, in which I'll talk about reset dynamics and dynamical phase transitions. And it's here that we're going to borrow these results from a very old model of DNA. And then, depending on time at the end, I'll focus in a bit more on run and tumble processes and tell you something about bounds and possibly also about symmetries or lack thereof in those kind of active processes. So that's where we're going. So let's start with the introduction. As many people in non-equilibrium stuff is, I'm interested in distributions of currents in stochastic particle systems. So not just mean currents or typical currents, but the probability of fluctuations away from the typical behavior. And to make that concrete, we can think for now of a Markov process. Let's think of discrete time. Most of what I talk about today will be discrete time, so a Markov chain. And let's have the probabilities for now constant in time, so a time homogeneous Markov chain. Currents, of course, you can define all sorts of different currents in your favorite model. Uh, but let's think of something simple to make it concrete. So one way you can define a current is you can imagine taking some some bond or some plane in your particle model and simply counting minus one where the particle jumps backwards across that bond and plus one where the particle jumps forward. So it's like standing by the road, counting the number of cars that go by. And you can do that for some number of time steps, which I'm going to call a small a. And of course, in, in non-equilibrium, so in broken detail balance, systems are generally characterized by non-zero currents. You can come up with various other models where you're in non-equilibrium, but still you have zero current. Um, but a general thing for non-equilibrium is that we have flows of stuff. And more than that, in Markov processes, if we look at the time average current, so if we take our integrated current over n time steps and divide it by the time we've measured, get the time average, 
And that generically obeys a large deviation principle. Of course, we had a nice introduction to large deviations when you go to share a few weeks ago. But very loosely, what that says is that the probability that my time average current takes some value small j looks in the long time limit like the exponential of minus some rate function multiplied by the time, the number of steps, small a. So what that tells me is that fluctuations away from the mean are getting exponentially more and more unlikely as I go to long times, and the rate function quantifies how fast that decays. And of course, you can write the rate function a bit more formally as a limit. The other thing you can do if you're interested in distributions of currents is you can think back to your undergraduate probability and you can say, well, I could look at a generating function. So let me define a generating function, which I'll call g in this talk, but n time steps with conjugate parameter k, and that's just the expectation of the exponential of k times my integrated current j to the n. And again, under fairly general conditions for Markov processes, this asymptotically has an exponential form where the thing that appears in the exponent here is the so-called scale cumulant generating function. And you can write that in the limit as well. And as we heard in Hugo's talks, you can often find this lambda k um, as the, the principal eigenvalue of some deformed, tilted, modified generator. Okay, so I think this gives us some insight into the structure of non equilibrium system mechanics and into this bridge to equilibrium. Because if you look at this, it perhaps reminds you of something. It's essentially how you define a free energy in equilibrium. Instead of in equilibrium, you have a system size going to infinity, a thermodynamic limit, and now I've got a time going to infinity. And the partition function in equilibrium is replaced by this generating function in non equilibrium. And just as in equilibrium stat mech, you then have this Legendre structure. So if lambda k is differentiable, you can take the Legendre Fenchel transform and you can get the rate function which we defined on the previous page. And as has been hinted several times in the last few weeks, if lambda k is not differentiable, then this Lagrange eventual transform only gives the convex hull in general of the rate function. And in general, non-analytic points in this scale cumulant generating function correspond to phase transitions, just like non-analytic points in the free energy correspond to phase transitions in equilibrium. So these are what we call dynamical phase transitions. They're not phase transitions in the steady state. They're phase transitions in the fluctuations. They tell you about the most likely mechanisms for realizing particular fluctuations. Okay, something else, which is a bit of an aside, but we'll meet later, is that at least if you don't have these weird dynamical phase transitions, then very often you have the so called Galvotti Cohen fluctuation relation, sometimes fluctuation theorem, but mathematicians get a bit upset with this use of the word theorem, which holds under, under quite general conditions, usually going to the title local detail balance or something like this. And what this is is a particular symmetry. It tells you that if you look at the probability of, say, seeing a backwards average current minus j, divided by probability of seeing a forwards current of the same magnitude, then in the long time limit, this looks like the exponential of minus some constant, kind of conjugate field, and uh, multiplied by j. So this quantifies, if you like, the breaking of the, the third law of the dynamics on a, a maximum scale. And this gives you a symmetry on the rate function, which is equivalent to a symmetry on the scale of the generating function, just that it's even about a particular point. So this is kind of all well known, Markov processes. The kind of questions that I'm interested in most of what I do are how does this picture change if we go away from a straightforward Markov process and perhaps we have memory or we have reset, which in some cases is connected to memory. How does the large deviation principle change? Is there still one? How do we calculate things? And I'm going to concentrate today on the, the case of reset. 
and think about how we can get this scale cumulative generating function. And we can't do this tilted generator approach. And then in what condition there might be a dynamical phase transition. And then there's a big overarching question that perhaps you can tell me about at the end is, well, is any of this uh, relevant for active processes in biology? Okay. So before we finish the introduction, we better say something about reset. And of course, we've had lots of talks on that. There's been lots and lots of interest in the past 10 years or so on processes where there's a stochastic reset to some fixed state or distribution of states. And some of the main proponents of this, people involved in this, of course, been at this program um, earlier on. A sort of paradigmatic example is, is search reinitialized to a starting position. I think it's Martin looking for his keys. Uh, but there are lots of other examples where this kind of reset pops up. Uh, population catastrophes, clearing of memory, and uh, some models of attachment to molecular motors. So we're going to think at the moment of reset as a, as a quite general thing. Could be as simple as, as just resetting an internal clock. and um, Something which resets the dynamic. And in the first part of the talk, which as I say will be the, the bulk of it, I'm going to talk about this kind of reset dynamics and dynamical phase transitions. What's this got to do with run and tumble? Well, I hesitate to, to talk about run and tumble to, to people working in biophysics. Um, but we know that this is at least a schematic of, of how things like bacteria move. And if you think about it, this is a kind of reset process. Not a reset process where the bacterium is reset to a particular point, but the thing that is reset at every time you tumble is the preferred direction. So it's a kind of reset process in, in velocity space or with a preferred direction. And that's a sort of example of a, of a general class of models where you can think of taking your favorite Markov process with the preferred direction. And you can let that run for a while, run. On top of that, you can add some stochastic reset of the preferred direction to top. And if your, your distribution of the run lengths is geometric in discrete space, in discrete time or exponential or continuous time, then actually this class of models is Markov on extended state space. If you have some non geometric or non exponential, distribution of run lengths, things are a bit more complicated, but you can still say quite a lot. And the second part of the talk, depending on time, I'll tell you something about the so-called thermodynamic uncertainty relation for models in this class, and a little bit of work in progress on first passage symmetries or lack thereof. Okay, so back to the outline. So we've dealt with the introduction. So let's get into the details of the first part. So I want to make the framework concrete. So we're going to think about a Markov chain as we were thinking about roughly before. So Markov chain discrete time. But now we're going to allow the possibility that the probabilities in that chain have some kind of weak dependence on time. Sufficiently weak that there's still a stationary state if I let the thing run. So perhaps rates that the probabilities that decay to some constant, something like that. And again, we're going to think about the, the current in this Markov process after n time steps, counting the net number of jumps. And we're going to assume that with the probabilities we've chosen, the time dependence we have, we have stationary states and we have a generating function with this exponential form we saw before. Where I put a zero on the generating function and the scale cumulative generating function to indicate this is the underlying process without reset. And then on top of that, we add reset in the following way. At every time step, with probability f, we have a reset. The reset costs us the time step here, and no current flux. So the analysis is reset, but there's no movement, nothing happens. And with probability one minus f, we don't reset and the process just evolves according to whatever probabilities are going on and the current is incremented. And the question that we want to answer is, well, how does adding this reset change the generating function? I mean, apart from the fact that we kind of slow things down because every now and then we have to stop and reset, 
We also have to worry about the possibility of finite time contributions. So when we wrote this, we just looked at the long time exponential behavior of the generating function, but there could well be finite time corrections. And if we're resetting before we've really got to the stationary state, those finite time corrections can be amplified and they can play a role in changing the generating function. But that's really the question. Can we, by resetting, sort of amplify those finite time corrections? And do we see interesting things? In particular, is there a phase transition to a regime where the most likely way to see a particular current fluctuation, perhaps particularly big current fluctuations, corresponds to just not resetting at all, paying the probabilistic cost of not resetting in order to see a particularly high current, for example? And that's the the thing which I want to convince you is related to DNA. So now I'm walking back on the, the side of the bit where I'm less familiar, but I'm told this is a schematic of DNA. Um, of course, Cambridge has a lot to do with, with the helix structure. Um, but roughly speaking, we have these two chains of monomers um, that are bound in pets. And I'm told, I've never done it, but I'm told that if you heat DNA, then you can break some of these bonds and you get these kind of bubbles where the, the bonds are pulled apart. And if you keep eating, then it may be that at some critical temperature, the whole thing just unzips. So you get a phase transition in temperature um, to a phase where there are, there are no bound one repairs. And this, it turns out, is exactly analogous to the situation we're thinking about with this set. Let me try and show you the details of that. So what we need is this very old model of DNA, the Perlin Scheringer model, um, which is now I think maybe 60 years old. Um, so really doing up to the minute biological stuff here. Um, so here's the, the schematic of the Perlin Scheringer model. I have again my uh, monomer pairs, which can be bound or can be unbound. And I map that to my reset process in the following way. The spatial dimension here, becomes a time dimension, so it becomes the number of steps in my process. And I'm plotting now for some sample trajectory, the integrated. And the mapping goes in the following way. Everywhere in my polar showing model, I have a bound pair, then I have reset. And remember, for reset, we said the current is not incremented, we just reset the dynamics of the space. Everywhere I have a stretch where the pairs are not bound, I have a section of trajectory without reset. And then my process evolves. So the random walk or the many particle process does its, its normal stochastic evolution. So the current is made up of by a sum of increments, um, which in general won't be ID. They might have some dependence on the time since the reset. And then I have another reset period corresponding to this bound section here. And then another unbound section, which gives me a section without resets, where I restart my dynamics. So I start again with the random variable x1, and the current evolves in some specific way. And then bound, reset, unbound, no reset, and so on. And I have a quick question. Yeah. So, it doesn't really say much about the reset. So does it always reset at the same point? And um, so all I require is that the reset um, doesn't change the uh, the current. So we don't reset the current. The integrated current we've got so far stays, stays the same. And um, I then reset the dynamics at some point. So that could be I take around the walk back to the beginning, or it could just be that some time dependent probabilities have an internal fork reset or something like this. It doesn't have to be a case where I go back to the beginning. Is the distribution of X1 always the same? Yes. Uh, you need something like that. Yeah, right? exactly. You need exactly. it on the first, on the, on the end step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that, that, that might mean reset to the position or front wall. You don't have to do that, of course. And then you do need to reset your, your, your populace and stuff. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, here the uh, reset is the equivalent to like one over temperature or something? Uh, we'll come to that. Um, <laughs> You will come to the it's not it's not quite straightforward as that, but let me let me go a bit further and just come up there. 
So in the in the problem showing the model, we have phase transitions as a, as a function of temperature, and our, our order parameter is the fraction of bound monomers. In our model, we have phase transitions as a function of this conjugate parameter in the generating function. Um, so the thing that plays the role of temperature is the K in the generating function. Um, and as we play with that parameter, which tells us about unlikely fluctuations, um, then we may or may not see a phase transition. And our order parameter is going to be the fraction of steps in the trajectory that give us that particular uh, value of the current, um, which have reset. Was that? Yeah. Help? Yeah. Good. Okay. So once you've, you've got your head around this, then actually you can take all the machinery from this old public sharing model and apply it to models in this particular class of recent dynamics. In particular, we want to find the generating function for the current. So we can do the same construction as people use for the partition function in the poem showing. So what we do is we say, well, every time we have a, a loop or a section of n steps without reset, we can write down the generating function for that part, which in poem sharing the language is usually called mu. But this is the generating function for n steps without reset. Well, it's the generating function of my original no reset process for n steps multiplied by the probability I don't set for n steps, one minus f to the n. And then we have a, a v generating function. That's the generating function for a section of n consecutive steps with reset. And that's even easier. It's just the probability that I reset for n steps in a row, f to the n, and there's no current. So exponential zero gives me one. And then, of course, to find the, the generating function of the whole thing, you want to sum over all possible trajectories in my reset language and um, for all possible chain configurations in that department sharing the language, which means you've got to sum over these alternating new V things. But the problem is you've got to fix the total length to be the length of your chain or the number of your time steps um, in a non equilibrium setting. And the usual trick there, of course, is that to get rid of that ugly constraint, you do a Laplace transform. So here we're in discrete time. So this is a discrete Laplace transform, Z transform. And so the things with tildes on the left are the Laplace transform things. And these are my original generating functions on the right. The thing I really want to find is the generating function for n steps with reset. And this is its Laplace transform. And here I have the Laplace transform of the um, section of n consecutive steps um, with reset and the Laplace transform of the piece and uh, n consecutive. Sorry, this is without reset and this is the piece with reset. So the u and v. Yeah. Yeah. So u is the section where I have no reset for n steps, v is the section where I have reset for n steps and I want to put them all together and find the generating function of the whole thing. Okay, and the v1 is so easy that I can already calculate the plus transform and um, on the back of postage stamp. I'm done with that. But now, of course, having gone to this, this plus transform picture and um, the total of the steps is now not the fix, it fluctuates, it's like a grand canonical um, ensemble in time. And if I really want to consider a particular time, then at the end, I have to tune my Z so that the average uh, length of the chain is the one I want. But I can do the, the summing over all trajectories then very easily because every trajectory is alternating mu and v, u tilde, v tilde in the plus picture. And I just have to sum over trajectories which have u tilde v, trajectories which are u tilde v tilde, u tilde v tilde, and so on. So I have a, a, a geometric sum. So I get from my Laplace transform version of the generating function of the full process uh, something that looks like this. The things on the top depend on what you do at the boundaries, whether you insist you start with a reset, this kind of stuff. Um, but the thing on the bottom, you recognize as the familiar denominator from some a uh, geometric series. And then if you want to know what happens for large system sizes in the Pernod sharing model, or for long times in this reset model, then actually 
What you care about is the poles in this thing. In particular, you want to know with my sign convention for the Z, you want to know the largest real value of Z at which this thing diverges. So let's dig into that a little bit. So here again, here's my generating function of the ball process, Laplace transformed in terms of the Laplace transform pieces for sections without reset, sections with reset. Obviously, there's a pole when the denominator here is zero. And that's the pole you get if there's no phase transition. So all you do is you say, well, what value of Z would correspond to the denominator being what being zero, so u tilde v tilde being one, and that gives me this z star, which will depend on the value of k I put in, of course, and it'll be a function of k. And then if I take the logarithm of that, that gives me the scale of cumulative generator. So it's exactly analogous to what people did 60 years ago for a show. But it could be that for whatever value of k I've chosen, that this z star reaches the point at which u tilde itself blows up, the convergence bounding point on u tilde. You can show actually that you don't have to worry about v tilde blowing up. Yeah, it doesn't play a role. So it could be that you also get a case that you have to worry about where before you hit z star, at the same time as you hit z star, u tilde blows up. And where u tilde blows up, it's what we call zc, and that will again depend on k. And if those things cross over, then you get a crossover to a scale cumulative generating function, which looks like the logarithm of zc of k, which is very easy to show, actually, looks like the scale cumulative generating function of my original process with no resets at all, plus the log of one minus. And this corresponds to a phase transition to a regime where current, where current fluctuations, particularly large current fluctuations, are most likely to be realized by trajectories with no reset events. And you can see that because remember that in the definition of the scale cumulative generative function, we had a one over n. So this corresponds to a cost one minus f per time step. So it corresponds to paying the probabilistic cost of not resetting in order to be able to see particular current fluctuations more likely. So that's all we have to do for a particular model. We have to look to see, well, do these things cross over? And that will tell us whether there's a phase transition or not. We can get even more from this old phone sharing model. We can say something about the, the time of the phase transition. And in order to understand that, we need to know about the behavior of the plus transform of the generating function for the piece without resets in the neighborhood of the convergence back. And that itself depends on the sum leading terms, the finite time corrections in U. So U, remember, is the generating function for N pieces without reset. So it's got one minus F to the A. And we know that asymptotically, it just looks like E to the N lambda zero k, but there might be some finite time corrections, some power law corrections. And the point of showing your argument, you can show this quite easily if you know something about convergence of series, tells you that you can classify the phase transition depending on what the power that appear, appears here is. If the power, power c on the bottom is less than or equal to one, which includes the case where you have time homogeneous um, Markov dynamics between the resets. And um, then it's quite straightforward to show that you don't have a phase transition at all. On the other hand, if C is bigger than one and less than or equal to two, then you have a continuous dynamical phase transition, meaning that as you approach the critical value of K, the average length of the segment without reset gets longer and longer and longer, and it diverges at the transition point. On the other hand, the C bigger than two, then you have a first order dynamical phase transition, 
with a cusp, and we see an example in a moment in the scale cumulative generator. And that corresponds physically to the case where as you get closer and closer to the base transition point, the average length of the segment without reset gets longer and longer, but it's still finite at the phase transition point, and then it has to jump to a point. So the normal terminology of a first order phase transition. And this is exactly the same classification as Perl Scheringer model. This is just borrowing everything from Perl Scheringer uh, with the only slight added subtlety that in our model this. This power can depend on the conjugate parameter k, so you have to do a bit more work to find out what it is um, for a particular model at a phase transition. Okay, so let me show you how that works for a simple example. So what happens when c is less than one? Uh, c is less than one, you have no phase transition. Um, so if you take actually time homogeneous Markov dynamics, um, then c is, c is zero. And you can put reset in, and obviously the generator is going to change, but you're not going to get any of these weird transitions. So you need to have something else like some, some weak dependence on time and to have these finite power or finite time corrections of a form that will be giving you a dynamic phase transition. Let me show you an example, uh, and then it's still not clear. Uh, you ask again. This is a very simple example. My underlying process is a random walk and uh, discrete time. But no, in continuous space. Um, and the steps I take from a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, with mean zero, so symmetrical, uh, but a variance that depends on the number of steps since the reset. So this is this kind of weak dependence on time. A capital B and D are just parameters here. I is the number of steps since the reset. So you can see that the variance approaches two from below as we go to. Uh, longer and longer times since we say. And in that case, you can very easily work out what the generating function for n steps without reset is, and look out what this u is, contains harmonic numbers, and for large n, it looks like this. Well, that should be an f, not trapped in. So the exponent in the bottom here is the parameter b in the model, and then k squared, so this is dependent on k. But then we can play with B in our model, we can do some numerics, and we can see these different phase transitions. So here I plot the scale cumulative generating function against K. I only plot the positive K because it's even. So K equals zero corresponds to the mean current. K positive corresponds to fluctuations above the mean. K negative corresponds to fluctuations below the mean. The blue line corresponds to B equals zero. So that's the case where I have no dependence on the time since reset, I have a Markov process um, between my resets. That's the C equals zero case, Tony is asking about. And actually you can't really see it down here. It's, it's buried under the yellow line. It starts at zero, it must. And it gets closer and closer for large K to the black line, which corresponds to having no resets, but it never actually reaches there. It just gets closer and closer. So there's no phase transition. On the other hand, if you put B equals 0.5, you can show then that the value of K where you have crossover, and that gives you a value of C that puts you in this continuous uh, phase transition regime. And that's this, this orange line. So again, it starts at zero, it gets closer and closer to the black line, but at some point it hits the black line and you switch over to sitting on the black line to having no recess at all. Not having very few resets, but really having no resets. So, for very large current fluctuations in this model, once you get above currents corresponding to this value of k, then the most likely way you see them is just not to reset. But notice that the derivative is the same both sides of this phase transition. On the other hand, if you make b even bigger, um, then you can get to a regime which puts you in the first order case. And that's this green line, which again hits the black line at some point, but now with a cusp with a different derivative either side of the transition. As the argument generated functions are a bit hard perhaps to get your head around, so you can then push on the transform to see what that looks like uh, for the red function. That's what you didn't expect, but maybe you're thinking, hang on. You told me that I could only do this Legendre transform and get the rate function. 
in a large scale human generated function um, was differentiable. And for the green case, it wasn't. So when I do the Lagrange differential transform in the, in the green case, the case of uh, strong dependence on time since reset, I find this straight line section, which is the convex hull of the rate function. So then you might say, well, how do I know what the rate function really looks like? Well, actually, in this case, you can argue on, on physical grounds, but because there are a no long range correlations of time, as the reset wipes out the correlations every time you reset. If I want to see a current fluctuation that's somewhere in the middle here, the most likely way I do that is that the trajectory spends part of its time sitting here and part of its time sitting here. And so you get this straight line construction in the middle. This is just the Maxwell construction, but in time rather than space. So it's phase separation in time rather than phase separation in space. Okay. That was a very simple model. Let me try and tell you what that has to do with some models that people have played with with run and temple. Yeah. The state line. The yes, the state line. line in this case is the, is the rate function. Uh, but I can only prove that by this sort of physical Maxwell construction argument, not by anything anything more rigorous. Um, well, there should be an easy bound. Yeah. So Neither above nor below the straight line. Yeah, 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 you're probably right. Yeah. Good. So, what about run and tumble? Well, here again is our cartoon of run and tumble. And you can use this process for run and tumble, where the thing you're resetting is the, the preferred direction. And actually, once you've, you've sort of spotted the setup, you don't really need to keep the U and V separate because every tumble is followed by a run. So as long as you allow for the runs to be of zero length, you can kind of combine them into a tumble run event. And effectively, instead of having U, V everywhere, you have W everywhere, but you do the same kind of scaling arguments. And if you do that, you can confirm with this whole framework some results that were found in different ways. And so what these guys did was they took run and tumble walks in different dimensions and they looked at the end to end length of the walk projected on the x axis. So they take the two ends of the walk, they project on the x axis, and they look at the end to end. And I think they had a constant speed ballistic motion in the runs, but of course, the projection onto the x axis depends on the angle you chose in the tumble. So the increment along the x-axis for every run is a stochastic variable. And moreover, when you think about that projection, it depends what dimension you were in to start. And it turns out that if you mess around with Bessel functions, that gives you power law corrections. And look at the power law corrections for different dimensions and predict whether or not you see a phase transition. And what you find from this Bowen Scheringer argument exactly what they found from some exact calculations is that you have a, a continuous dynamical phase transition for d greater than three and less than or equal to five and a first order dynamical phase transition for d greater than five which i'm guessing is not relevant to biology <laughs> but, uh, there we are uh, there's also been more recent work with Satya and co um, and where they incorporated distribution of run speeds um, which then again changes the, the distribution of increments along the x-axis and changes the criteria for phase transitions. But again, with our framework, we can, we can reproduce the, the conditions they find for different phase transitions. Okay. Well, that was the main thing I wanted to tell you about. Let me, in the last 10 minutes or so, focus in a bit more on run and tumble and tell you about a couple of, of other things. So the first thing relates to these. Yes. Sir. Uh, maybe you mentioned this, uh, you can go back to this. Uh, so yeah. So the, so it is a, it is, it is a velocity reset in the sense that the direction and this, the value of the velocity also is the same. And um, so I think in, uh, Bresnans and um, Vandenberg, I think they had constant velocity, um, but they just choose the direction. Um, so then the only thing that controls the component you have on the x-axis is, is the angle. Um, 
And then what Satya and Co did was they allowed for distribution of velocities as well. And then depending on what your distribution of velocities is, also affects whether or not you see phase transitions in different dimensions. Okay, good. So the position is not reset at all. No, position's not reset. Only velocity. Yeah. But the thing they're measuring is the is the distance along the x-axis, basically. Good. So let me tell you a bit more briefly. Uh, about something to do with thermodynamic uncertainty relations, and those people who are here for the, the workshop week, we have, of course, you know, side quick, and it's a very nice overview there. Um, they've also popped up a few other times, I think, um, in the, the seminar on, on clocks and topological states we had on Monday, um, and it was relevant there. What do thermodynamic uncertainty relations do? Well, they compare values of the, the mean current. Now I've switched my time, my time label to T rather than N because I'm also going to think about continuous time, but it's the same thing. They compare values of the mean current and the scale bearings. And essentially the quantity of the square of the mean divided by the scale bearings is a measure of the, the uncertainty of the process or the precision, depending which way up you put it and whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. And there's a, there's a, a quite well-known bound now, and um, Cifert in 2015, that says in continuous time Markov processes, this quantity, so the square of the mean divided by the variance, scale variance by that time, is always less than or equal to the mean rate of entry production in the whole process divided by two. And this is trivial for a system where there's no drift because then J bar is, is zero. But if you're out of equilibrium, so you've got some non zero mean current, then as temp kind of tells you how much thermodynamic cost you have to pay to have a particular precision, to get the variance down to a particular value. So this is the original bound for continuous time Markov processes. Um, a little bit later, um, we've shown that that doesn't hold for discrete time Markov processes, but at least for long times, there's a, a variant of it, where just the right-hand side changes a little bit. Um, but the important thing is that these bounds hold for any current in your process, and S tote is the, the total entry. Mean um, for total entry production. And the question is well, what about our kind of models? You know, discrete time, then discrete time. What about this kind of run and tumble dynamics? And let me give you one concrete example. Um, Relates a little bit to the model of persistent random walkers that Martin talked about last week. Um, that we can calculate everything that we can test bounds on, and then I'll try to persuade you that the results we find hold for J. So this is a, a very simple model of run and tumble, but now is in one dimension. And at each time step, the particles tumbles with probability f, or runs with probability one minus f. Minus the reset stuff. And in a run. It just does a one dimensional asymmetric random walk with a probability p primed of going in the preferred direction and one minus p primed of going in the other direction. So, p prime is one, you have ballistic runs, essentially what Martin was looking at. And uh, if p prime is not one, you have some noise in the runs as well. And at a tumble, you set the preferred direction and we set it right with probability p or left with probability one minus p. This is a perfectly well behaved Markov process. So, by that whole kind of showing the stuff I talked about before, you can show that it doesn't have any phase transitions. Uh, you can explicitly calculate the scale key generating function using that, that machinery. It looks a bit ugly. In fact, this is written in a particularly ugly way. You can make it look a bit better than this, but you can, you can work it out. Uh, and from the scale key generating function, you can get for the derivatives the mean current. Uh, which has the kind of form you'd expect. Um, and you can also get an explicit expression for the variance, which is a bit longer. And one thing that you spot, what you don't really spot, you have to, to play around with it to see, is that you don't have this, this so-called galawatt cohen symmetry in the scale cumulative generating function, except in some very special cases. And the very special cases are the cases where P equals a half, or P prime equals a half, Correspond to zero current, everything's symmetric. So there you kind of have a, 
an active particle, it's still doing runs with a preferred direction, but it's just a line to run in one direction as the other. And so everything is, is, is well behaved. Um, so that's kind of um, active particle, if you like, but with no drift. Um, in other cases where you get Galavotic owner, if P equals zero or P equals one, which means that you're always tumbling in the same direction. So then you basically just have a biased random walk. So you really have a passive particle. But in the general case where you have this kind of activity, particles changing their direction and you have a drift, you don't have this if you want to count the search. But you can calculate the mean and the variance, so you can calculate this uncertainty exactly. What we wanted to do was have a general approach that would give us a bound in cases where we couldn't calculate exactly. I think I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it uses the maths of renewal reward theory. So you treat the model as a renewal process with inter-occurrence times capital N, that's just the length of the runs basically. And you say, well, I know the total current is the sum of the currents in each of the runs, which are independent, plus whatever's left in the last bit of run that I haven't finished. And then you assume that in each of the runs, the current is a random variable, which is a product of a part that depends on the run length, capital R, and a part that depends on the preferred direction. So these are both random variables, and they give me a random current increment for each run. But once you've done that, um, then you can use standard asymptotic results from renewal reward theory to get long time limits of the, the mean and the scale variance in terms of various moments and joint moments in the, in the model. So moments of the run lengths and of the tumbling parameter and of the current in each run. So in principle, if you know these things, you can get the certainty exactly. But what you can then show is if you make some reasonable assumption on scaling, uh, you can get a bound from this full exact expression, which doesn't require you to know as much. And you can combine that with the, the discrete time bound of uh, proteins and van der Broek on the tumbles to get an expression which is only a bound, not exact, but bound to the uncertainty in these kind of ways. And this bound contains a Three factor which contains only statistics of the run length. You don't have to know anything about the, the dynamics during the runs, so you just have to know the statistics of the run length. And the entropic part, which contains only the entropy from the tumbles. And this bound is expected to be the tightest um, in the case where um, the runs are relatively long, so where you have persistence. And you can check that on our simple, stupid, one-dimensional run and tumble model. This is just the model I explained to you a few minutes ago, where our, our tumble variable is just plus one when I choose um, preferred direction right and minus one when I choose A. And here I plot this uncertainty quantity against P. When P is 0.5, the mean current is zero, so zero, and then it increases as P goes towards zero. Uh, the blue is the exact analytic curve, the green is the results of simulation as a sanity check, and the red dash is our bound, which works pretty well. I know that it's a much better bound, except when I'm very close to P equals zero or one, than this black line, which is just the bound you get by naively applying the discrete time bound in extended state space. So this model is Markov extended state space, so you can take the original uh, Prozman's van der Broek bound for discrete um, time and that gives you this black line, which is a bound, but it's, it's not very useful. Um, so, at least in this case, we get a better bound. And then you can do other cases where you can't work things out so easily. You can look at non uh, geometric run lengths. And uh, so, here are some different distributions of run lengths. The solid curves are the, the uncertainties and the dashed lines and bounds. The renewal reward framework also holds actually in continuous time. Um, so you can play with continuous time models, you can play with many particle models. Uh, so this was the asymmetric exclusion process where the, the tumbling is a collective tumble. So all the particles change their preferred direction at the same time. And again, here actually you can work out the uncertainty analytically and you can bound it uh, using the approach I just showed. That was some work on bounds. 
And then even more briefly, a little bit of work in, in progress on first passages, which I think maybe have some, some relevance in biology. It turns out that there's a, a particular symmetry on first passage time distributions and for Markovian processes, which goes like this. Supposing I take a, a bias random walk and I start at zero, and I put an absorbing boundary at plus L, absorbing boundary at minus L, and I let the random walk do its thing until it hits one of its boundaries. And then I build a histogram of the times at which it hit the top boundary and a histogram of the time at which it hits the bottom boundary. But if the bias is up the page, of course it's going to hit the boundary at the top more than the bottom. But if I normalize the histograms, they look exactly the same. All right. So the mean first passage time and all of the moments are the same hitting plus L and minus L. At first sight, that's a little bit surprising. And this was kind of brought to people's attention, I think, in this paper, but it had been actually seen in various situations before then. And in fact, the, the magic that underlies it is exactly the same magic you use if you use method of images and to calculate um, absorption uh, probabilities and so on. So you can convince yourself that it makes sense. It relates also to this local detailed balance condition. You can prove it more formally and um, using the fact that that's what these guys did, that the exponential of minus the entropy is a martingale and the entropy is proportional to the displacement. Uh, this kind of model, uh, so results for the martingale here, you can this result. Fine. But in our run and tumble model, well, e to the minus s with entropy on the extended state space is still a martingale. But the entropy is no longer proportional to the curve, so there's no reason why this should hold. And in fact, there's a bit more you can say. Turns out, perhaps other people knew, knew this, but I've only fairly recently um, understood it, that there's a, a correspondence between fixed time ensembles and fixed displacements ensembles. This is work of Gingrich and Horowitz. And if you put your walls a long way away, so you look for, for large L, the distributions of the first passage times to reach the top boundary and the bottom boundary have a large deviation form, where the large deviation parameter now is L. And this rate function can be got directly, though not always particularly easily, from the rate function. So if you know the rate function for the current, and then you can get the large deviation form for the first passage times. And even more deeper magic, it turns out, and again, you can convince yourself that this has to be the case, that the galavotic error and fluctuation relation for the current implies this first passage time. And since in our run and tumble models, we don't have galavotic error when we have activity and drift, and we don't expect this first passage time symmetry. Um, and indeed, we've done if you do simulations, you don't find the symmetry. And um, so this is work of some Phoenix students working with us on this. Um, this is plotting the, the callback Leibler divergence, comparing the distribution of first passage times to the top boundary to the one bottom boundary. And it's not zero. Um, it has some kind of expected behavior. So it's plotted against the, the probability of tumbling. As f goes to zero, well, as f goes to zero, um, you tumble less and less. So at least if your boundaries are finite, you're going to reach the boundaries before you tumble. So you've just got a bias random walk. And so the symmetry is restored. As F goes to one, well, then you're tumbling more and more and more and more. So you don't have time to, to run anywhere. Your runs are all of like one. And so you've just got a lazy random walk. So again, the symmetry is restored. But in the middle, you have something that's non-zero. So the two distributions are different. And slightly weirdly, it has this, this two-peak structure. Um, and you can understand that heuristically um, by some arguments about scaling lengths, um, which I won't go into. You can get the second peak from large deviations because you know the large deviations of the current. Um, but this first peak seems to be a kind of finite size effect, corresponds to cases where the most likely trajectories to reach the top boundary in the preferred direction correspond to not tumbling, and the most likely trajectories to reach the bottom boundary involve a tumble. So it's a kind of finite size effect. And indeed, 
what we do at the moment is we're going to bigger and bigger system sizes and this, this trough gets pushed to the left, this peak gets kind of squeezed out. But there's the still some work to understand more details analytically and to see how general uh, this framework is. But I think I'll, 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 I'll wrap up. I hope I, I showed you that we have this mapping between the partition function in the DNA model, the current generating function in the reset processes with time playing the role of space. And this allows you to easily identify and characterize space transitions in various models people have looked at, particularly in Roman Temple. And there are also other extensions of different variants of reset you can deal with. The things I've been thinking about in the, the last couple of weeks and um, later to other things in the program. One is can one find non equilibrium examples where you have coexistence of more than two dynamical phases? So that would correspond to the, the equilibrium stuff that, that Andrew was talking about, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so maybe one can cook up some model where you have phase separation in time into, into three phases. And then I suppose more generally, I want to know what, yeah, whether any of these bounds or symmetries or lack of them have particular biological implications. But let me stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, so, in the case of the spontaneous dynamic of expectation, is that like the of I mean, I guess you have this. For example, if you look at the example of the trajectory of your I mean, in the sense that you suddenly, you suddenly, as you tune this parameter. K, okay, you suddenly jump from there being kind of long but finite lengths without reset to there being essentially infinite lengths without reset. It's so, kind of also related to the second question of the slide, right? So the system of the dynamic of the phases. So then how do you visualize this? So that means that if if I say, well, I'm doing a simulation, because it's very hard to do simulations for these things, but I'm doing a simulation and I want to see a particular current that is above the, the mean, let's say. Um, so I run my simulation many times and I pick out all of the trajectories which have that particular value of the current. And the fancier things you can do, and God knows what that is. But I say, let me just pick out those particular trajectories that have this value of the current. They're, they're rare and they get exponentially rarer as I go to longer and longer times, but let me find those trajectories. Then I'll find that if I look at them, that they're trajectories where for some fraction of the trajectory, there's a whole period where I'm, I'm resetting every now and then. Um, Maybe a long time between resets, but I'm, I'm doing my dynamics, I'm resetting, doing some dynamics, I'm resetting. And then there's a transition at some point in the trajectory to a period where I'm not, not resetting at all. So there's, there's a really sort of qualitatively different behavior in different parts of the, the trajectory. So that's what you call different. Yeah, so it's a kind of phase transition in, in time in the same way in a phase in space, you get qualitatively different behavior in one part of your the system together. Have a question for me? What about the, you said for the uh, reset part of the beginning, but if it's a regular, it has to process everything in time. Yeah. It can't ever have to be. Yeah. But then for the, but then just a random couple seems quite, quite harmless. And um, it's because you're, you're effectively coarse graining and projecting onto the x axis. So you've basically got hidden variables. And so it's not a Markov process on the x axis. But if it's J, that would not. Um, so, yes, yes, James, you know, the yeah, you can't have anything to do. They're not, not yeah, they wouldn't be for any for many complicated things, yeah. I think it's not that, yeah, it's not that rare, yeah, I guess not. Other questions, comments? Maybe I have a simple question. So, at uh, the top of this slide, you are writing that the, so there was a mapping, the partition function of the model to this uh, recent form. Mm -hmm. was, was this mapping kind of exact? So, so the recent process it can be formulated as an equilibrium program or it's a more technical analysis? Um, well, I 
would say uh, it, it, it's, it's really it's really oh, exact. In, oh. I, I suppose there's a there's a subtlety is that in the Perlman Schrodinger model, the temperature is a real parameter that you can you, know, you can really change in your lab. Whereas the, the thing that that maps to is this, this conjugate parameter in the in the um, in the generating function, which is not something you can so directly um, play with. Although you can do it in simulations. Mm -hmm. You know, when we consider an equilibrium program with vision with uh, symmetric matrix, but when we consider stochastic process, we also need to use asymmetric, non symmetric matrix. Is there that such kind of difference, or in this case, just, yeah, just uh, um, maybe, uh, yeah, I think I, maybe I misunderstood your question. I'm not saying I can map my my non equilibrium process with. Um, non-zero current with some bias rates to some equilibrium process where I'm still looking at current. I'm saying I can map it to an equilibrium process where I'm looking at um, some other quantity and where my, my time variable, my large, so I'm looking at large time, I'm looking at large system size. Um, so I'm not mapping to a, a kind of equilibrium dynamical process, I'm mapping to an equilibrium static process, I guess that's the fact. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Comment? If not, uh, let's thank Peter again.